Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, the Miami Book Fair, and everyone at Books and Books, I welcome you to tonight's virtual evening with Adam Rutherford to discuss his new book, How to Argue with a Racist, published by The Experiment. Referred to as the ultimate anti-racism guide by author Caroline Criado Perez, the book emphatically dismantles outdated notions of race by illuminating what modern genetics can and can tell us about human difference. This international bestseller breaks down discoveries in human genetics that when accurately understood are essential evidence to combat racism and inform our casual conversations about race. Adam Rutherford is a geneticist, science writer, and broadcaster. He studied genetics at University College London, and during his PhD on the developing eye, he was part of a team that identified the first known genetic cause of a form of childhood blindness. As well as writing for the science pages of The Guardian, he has written and presented many award-winning series and programs for the BBC, including the flagship weekly Radio 4 program, Inside Science. He's also the author of The Book of Humans, a new evolutionary history that explores the paradox of the human animal. A brief history of everyone who ever lived was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in Nonfiction and Creation on the Origin of Life and Synthetic Biology was shortlisted for the Welcome Book Prize. Adam is joined in conversation tonight by Thomas Chatterton Williams, the author of Losing My Cool and Self-Portrait in Black and White. He's a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine, a columnist at Harper's, and a 2019 New America Fellow. His work has appeared in the New, York, the New Yorker, the London Review of Books, The Atlantic, and has been collected in the best American essays and best American travel writing. He's the recipient of a Berlin Prize, and we thank him for joining us tonight. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by circling the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and you can find How to Argue with a Racist and, and Self-Portrait in Black and White and any other book you might need for purchase at Books and Books below by pressing the green button. I can't stress enough how every purchase you make right now really helps to keep books and books open. So if you love us, hit that green button. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the stage. Hi, Adam. Hi, Christy, how are you? Hi, Thomas. Hello. There you go. Hey, Adam. Hey, good to see you, man. It's good to see you again, yeah. Um, man, congratulations on the publication in America of uh, such an essential book. And I was really intrigued to see how you already began to flip it and bring in um, new conversations that have happened since I saw you, I guess, in February in London. Um, mm -hmm. You addressed both um, the racialization of the conversation around coronavirus and also the kind of um, unprecedented uh, mass protests for racial justice that have erupted internationally since the death of uh, George Floyd. Um, how did you get that done so so quickly? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, I mean, it seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Because we, we met in London doing a podcast together for The Spectator. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that was that February? Was that was that when that happened? It must it, it, February or March. I'm sorry, early March. Yeah. And then the world turned upside down. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I got COVID and got pretty badly hit by it. And I'm, I'm one of the long termers as well. So uh, the publication date for the the U.S. publication date for How to Argue with the Racist was was switched around a couple of times, and then you know we figured it was an election year, and then COVID happened, and then Black Lives Matter happened, and so we decided to bring it back. and And basically, it just was well, it became impossible not to talk about initially COVID because that was racialized very very quickly in two discrete ways. The, the first was the provenance of the virus itself. So the fact that it comes from China, mm -hmm. um, th there's been thou literally thousands of, of racist attacks based on, on that 
it has its own Wikipedia page for racialized violence in America, um, which which documents it says something like three thousand attacks since March, and it's an international effect too. Um, and you know, not helped by President Trump talking about it in pretty racialized terms and racist terms, in fact. So calling it, he calls it the China virus, and he also calls it some some pretty offensive things as well. So that was one one half of the racialization of COVID. And then the other half was from right from the beginning, from March, we were beginning to see that in the UK, I'm in London right now, um, in the UK, black and Asian people were at a much higher risk of infection and a much higher risk death rate as well. And in, in America, it was black and Asian and also Hispanic and Latino people. And immediately I started getting getting communications on social media and privately saying, well, doesn't this show that that, that there is a, a biologically racialized, uh, you know, underlying molecular biology, which is which is part of these this, this disparity? Um, to which the answer is, well, almost certainly not, um, because, the, the, you know, those aren't racially coherent groups anyway, but also you know, medicine is heavily racialized because it's stratified by socioeconomic factors. And we know exactly the reasons why those their infection rates for those groups of people are much worse. They live in, right. they, they tend to live in socialized housing in urban areas with multi-generational families, tend to have key key worker status rather than being able to lock down, you know, and so on and so on. All things that we absolutely know exist because they're not exclusive to COVID. Nevertheless, you know, people really clawing for a biological reason that underlies the, the disparity in, in the infections. So anyway, to answer your question, there wasn't any way that I could get away with writing a book at this time on this subject without um, prefacing it again yeah. with, a, with a new introduction. I mean, I was thinking about you and, um, and the points you make in this book a lot when uh, it seems like such a long time ago in March or April when there were so many headlines. I mean, there were articles arguing that this was they were calling it a black plague and that just that 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 made me um deeply uh uncomfortable because there's a kind of like terrible history of uh, of thinking there's biological um correlation with uh, some people being susceptible to diseases or weaker or spreading diseases there's so many ways in which that discourse um can veer off into a very dark place. And um, I guess it has to do with one of the things you're talking about with the way we use words and terms is not always, um, we often um, use terms in ways that are ambiguous. And so we're having a conversation about race or about the way race intersects with biology or what it means to even call something a black plague. And it means very different things to different people who are hearing those terms and that kind of um, I think that kind of lack of precision causes a lot of problems in our discourse around race, and you really nail that in the book. Um, one of the things I wanted to start by talking with you about is that you describe this book as actually as a we as a weapon, as a weapon to bring into a kind of combat uh, with a racist, or maybe even with somebody who doesn't isn't aware they're being racist, but is reproducing racist uh, ways of thinking that can ultimately um, lead to the same effects. Can you expand on that? How how is this a weapon? Yeah, sure. So, you know, there's there's it's a short book, right? And there's only there's only actually four chapters, and there's about forty five thousand words. I wanted to be I wanted it to be sort of punchy, and you know, like you say, a weapon or a toolkit. Um, and part of it is about race, the concept of racial purity, and that that sort of that in in many ways that is sort of focused on real self declared actual white supremacists or neo Nazis. And that you know they are part of this contemporary conversation, and they're also part of the historical conversations about race. But in some senses, I'm slightly less interested in those discussions than I am with the the the, the conversations we have with people who just who don't think of themselves as being racist. But as you say, are, are they're, they're sort of the difference between, um, you know, in the Angela Davis phrase, the difference between a non-racist and an anti-racist, right? Uh, and, and in a sort of colloquial way, I'm. You know, we all get into these conversations when we're in the pub or in a bar or, you know, around the dinner table and stuff. And, and it's, it, it's often associated with positive attribute racism. So, you know, black people are better at sport or black people are better mm -hmm. at dancing or music or Jewish people are better at 
intellectual pursuits in, you know you know chess or have more Nobel prizes than any other group of people or East Asians are better at, uh, at maths or you know whatever it is the some of those things that I just mentioned have sort of data sets associated with them which reinforce those those stereotypes and others the data just falls apart as soon as you look at it but that's almost irrelevant to the broader point which is that those sorts of positive attributes racisms serve two things one is they're not necessarily true and they deserve scientific scrutiny to understand why whether or not they're true and why they might not be true but the second thing is that they always serve to reinforce historical structural racisms which are much more pernicious mm -hmm. than simply saying you know who doesn't want to be better at running the 100 meters or who doesn't want to be at, at maths because what they do in the case of so the the thinking about the physicalization of black men in particular the roots of that as an idea date back to the origin of contemporary racial taxonomies which mm -hmm. is in the 17th and 18th centuries where the, the first time we try and classify or I'm when I say we I mean European scientists or thinkers try and classify people in specific taxonomies they're, they're hierarchical with white people at the top and sub-Saharan African people at the bottom and they are descriptions which are primarily based on pigmentation and secondarily hair color and texture but mostly their behavioral characteristics like you know not intelligent but strong right or um in well, the case of i mean the, i'm sorry yeah, there was recently a controversy at the um the, the museum of african-american history on the on the mall in washington recently had um elements of um of, of whiteness uh kind of um, guidelines to understanding um, ideas about whiteness and one of the things was like um, belief in objectivity or o overvaluing the written word or things like this. I mean, that's, there's a kind of um, terrible conflation of, of race and, 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 and values that uh, and attributes that can be um, in any group. And I was wondering, yeah, how, yeah. how does that fit? Have you, were you aware of that? Did you see this conversation? It was influenced um, by Robin DiAngelo's work as well. No, I, I didn't. Down. I, I didn't actually see that, but but um, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me because it's right there in Linnaeus, right? And this is this is a point that I've been making more and more in in these sorts of talks. Um, that you know, science isn't exempt from society, and the structural racisms we see in society are exactly the same ones that we see in science because they because they're intertwined at the origin of of race in the European expansionist pro, uh, project in, in, you know, we call it the age of enlightenment in a, in a rather fond way, but it's also the age of subjugation and plunder and, and all those things as well. Um, it's right there in the writings of Linnaeus. It is his categorization of the, of, of the four subspecies of humans say exactly that the, the, those types of things, they have value judgments right in the same sentence next to black shiny skin or mm -hmm. yellow skin. I mean, they're, they're unequivocally, they're, they're sort of unequivocally racist in a sort of descriptive sense in, this, in their initial inception. And we're talking like mid 18th century here. And then they're unequivocally like e even more racist because of the value judgments that come with those descriptions. I don't have the book to hand, but it's like, you know, um, uh, Native Americans who are described as red skinned with straight black hair, that uh, govern via tradition and customs and are uh, haughty. Mm -hmm. um, East Asians who have yellow skin and thick black hair um, and are, um, are, are, are I, I meek, I believe, right? It was meek. Yeah, meek and, and also um, are greedy, right? Greedy. Mm -hmm. And, and um, Sub Saharan Africans are um, governed by caprice and, uh, and the, the women lusty and you think well you know this is I, I don't know why why anyone can take those sort of seriously as scientific designations in the same book where he's describing you know the animals of the world and the plants of the world and, and ge basic geology and saying fact 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 this is a kangaroo this is a the archetypal kangaroo this is what a rabbit does this is the the platonic version of a duck right and when it comes to humans he goes yeah, this, there, there's four skin colors, 
four hair colors <laughs> right. and these are the behaviors. super so, simplified. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I almost make a joke about this, but it, apart from the fact that it's, a, it's quite a sort of, it's, it's a pretty offensive idea, but he adds a fifth category of sub, sub, subspecies of humans in a later edition, which are Homo sapiens monstrosus, right? Mm -hmm. And these are myths and legends. So it's like, it, it includes feral wolf boys and <laughs> Patagonian dwarfs. And one of, I mean, perversely, one of my favorite sentences that I've ever had to type out, mono orchid hottentots, right? Mm -hmm. Which means men of the Khoisan who have one testicle, right? <laughs> and, and, and and it's it's nuts. It's completely nuts. And yeah. there it is. It goes. But this set know, the agenda for us for absolutely years. Yeah, absolutely. And and those in those stereotypes in in those value judgments are the roots of stereotypes that still persist to the right. to, to this day. Europeans are gentle, fair, inventive, and industrious. Um, when when I talk about sport in the book and, and in talks. There was an amazing study a couple of years ago by some sociologists who documented um, like 3,000 comments in, by, by media commentators in, in, in the TV, on, on TV and radio, um, when talking about elite athletes. And what they found is that in the majority of cases when the elite athlete they were talking about was African-American, the references would be to their physicality and their mm -hmm. ancestry, right? They're, they're strong, they're... Um, their, their, their bodily physique um and in the exactly the same proportions the vast majority of references to elite white athletes refer to their industriousness and their in intellect their intelligence so this stuff is it's baked into our culture and mm -hmm. we, we we just don't even notice it i i've, I've sort of ruined sports commentary for many people because <laughs> when you alert them to it you just hear it all the time yeah, I'm thinking about the way that, you know, Roger Federer is is described as opposed to someone like Mulfees or yeah, it's 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 all baked into the way we talk. But one of the things that you argue in the book is that genetics when properly understood uh gives us a meaningful um basis to refute uh, these kind of racist ideas. Um and I was interested in uh, in another move you make because you also qualify that and elsewhere you write uh, we are prone to saying glib things such as race doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. or race is just a social construct. While these sentiments may be well-intentioned, they can have the effect of undermining the scientifically more accurate way of expressing the complexities of human variation and our clumsy attempts to classify ourselves and others. Um, can you break these distinctions down? Because one of the things I try to do in my writing, and, and I realize that I'm, I'm not writing as a geneticist, is I try to um, take very seriously the claim that race is not real. And that leads me even to, to argue that uh, if race is not real, then isn't doubling down on it as a social construct, just saying that it wasn't, we made a mistake with calling it biologically real and now we're making, another, we're making the same mistake again mm -hmm. through another um, terminology. But, but you take a different view. To, I think that may be one of the few places where I felt in the book um, you might find me being a little bit uh, naive or, 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 or not going far enough or, or being thorough enough in my own critique. So I wanted to hear you flesh that out. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, this is why I like talking to you about this stuff because no one asks a question like that. Um, it's all softball, and, and, and <laughs> until you get questions like that. So, I mean, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. Um, the, 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 I guess, the first thing to say is the temptation to say that race doesn't exist, which I think is well intentioned and stems from it's a, it's a slight, it's a twisting of what is the more accurate way that I think it should be expressed and what I, what I say, argue in the book, which is that um, it, it's just not as pithy. The, the way that we talk about race using folk taxonomies or just the colloquial mm -hmm. understanding of how we define people doesn't tally with what we understand about biological variation as represented by the genome and the genome being the ocean from which human variation is drawn. Now, that doesn't mean to say that people aren't different around the world and that there are physical differences between people and that there is clustering of those physical differences around mm -hmm. the world. And I think that, I think sometimes in having these discussions, well-intentioned people fall into a sort of blank slate trap where be because the, um, they, they, they effectively deny the differences between people, which are 
both real, possibly meaningful, depending on what we're talking about, um, but also you're denying the obvious, the the, the obvious experiential, um, uh, what, what the experiences of, of, of people. If you go up to mm -hmm. someone and say, you know, this is a black person and this is a uh, Chinese person and say, well, race doesn't exist. You're asking someone to, to deny what they're seeing in front of, in front of their eyes. So that's what I mean when I say the glibness of these, of these arguments. Yeah. Um, it is possible to recognize that there is biological difference between people and that they cluster both geographically and they recapitulate the human, the, the human journey over the last, you know, 10,000 or a hundred thousand years or however, however, however you want to measure it. But the question is whether those differences are biologically meaningful and whether they align with our folk, folk taxonomies. And the answer to those questions is, well, you know, murky. It's, it's, it really depends on what you're looking at. Yeah, and it gets murkier in certain societies than others. Like, I would think that in America or in the UK, um, it's much more difficult to look at somebody's face and, and know exactly uh, and be able to read accurately their ancestry. Um, you're certainly an example. I'm, uh, living in France, I can be uh, misunderstood um, as being any number of things uh, that are that are represent any population group that is represented here from North Africa. I can be confused with, um, and so yeah, I. I I, I wanted to talk to you about Kamala Harris, actually, and the conversation that cropped up around her in, in, in this kind of same vein. What we mean, yes, when you look at somebody uh, who's from Sub-Saharan Africa and you look at somebody who's from East Asia, we, we, we make kind of judgments about what that means, but it can also break down. And oftentimes with mixes, uh, people can be perceived as an identity that is not in fact um, the identity that, that, that their ancestors would have claimed or that not everybody that they're descended from would have claimed. And it can kind of, um, that can become a social identity that gets uh, reified, I guess uh, it would, would be the term. So you have Kamala Harris, who's descended from uh, a Tamil mother uh, from India and um, a very mixed, um, partially British, partially African descended father from Jamaica. And you have, a, her growing up in America and um, at times being identified as, and sometimes identifying herself as African-American, which yeah. in the American discourse really uh, is less of a racial group than, um, than an ethnic group, um, descendants of American slavery. And that population is specifically tricky because that population can be anything from blue eyed and, yeah. and essentially ivory skinned to um, essentially um, ebony complected um, and indistinguishable from someone from sub-Saharan Africa. So what does it mean for her to be identified as African-American? And is this useful terminology to even, to even be reproducing in, in, in such a complicated uh, multi-ethnic society as 2020 America? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, it's weird being a geneticist and and spending a lot of my time denying the importance or downplaying the importance of genetics and the things that we're discussing. But when when you say when you describe it like that, which I think is accurate and and, and eloquent, what I'm hearing is these are cultural self identifiers that are determined by the lived experience of 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 those people. And you know, I, I know that then. Yeah, you get antagonistic, especially on social media, antagonistic people saying, well, if I declare that I'm African-American, does that mean I'm African-American? Uh, and in Kamala Harris's case, despite the fact that she is, she doesn't fit the exact mold of being directly descended from the en enslaved people in right. North America. Um, but, but she passes the eye test that you were kind yeah. of referring to before. People look at her and yeah. they read a racialized identity on her in this context of America. Yeah, yeah, I, I was getting, just before lockdown happened, um, I was in uh, uh, Dubai, at the Dubai Literary Festival. And so this has been a big learning process for me as well, because I think as you pointed out at, up top, we often just do not have the language to accurately describe either how we self-identify or the underlying biology or the underlying ancestry that comes with that. And, you know, both of us are mixed race, and you know, you write your whole book is about having uh, 
kids who yeah. are similarly mixed race but look well Swedish, right? You're, you're... Really look um, very phenotypically what people think of as 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 white white. You know, not uh, what I guess my sociologist father would call ethnic white, but yeah, blonde hair, blue eyes, very pale skin. Um, but you know, genetically, um, almost a quarter. Um, Sub-Saharan African descended, um, not visible to most people who they encounter in the street. But you know, like I, I want to say with, and, and I don't mean to keep um, going back to it, but I'm actually trying to figure this out myself, and and it's really interesting to talk about it with someone like you. Um, if there is no black essence, and I don't believe there is some essence that links everybody in the black uh, African diaspora. Yeah. then it isn't indistinguishable to be from Jamaica or to be from anywhere else and to replicate the same experiences in any other context. And if there is not a black essence, then the, and if it is cultural and based on how people perceive you, then, then that opens the door to actually not an antagonistic and trolling, but a very serious philosophical conversation about someone like Rachel Dolezal, I think. Yeah. Um, is it possible to um, become in a racially significant way, in the social construct way, part of a race that your ancestors were not directly linked to? Um, and if not, why not? Mm -hmm. And how does genetics help us in this, in this thorny <laughs> debate? Well, if or we can answer, not, is this the realm of outside if we, of if we can answer that in the next 20 minutes, then I think we've fixed everything. Um, <laughs> And in some way, I'm not dodging the question here, but in some ways this is kind of out, outside of my domain because the answer to the last bit that you said is that genetics, I don't think, does help that. And I think that we're good examples of that. Or anyone who has uh, uh, unusual or mixed ancestry or whatever the terminology is. I mean, I, I, I use myself as an example because when, you know, when part of one of the themes of the book is the rise of genetic ancestry testing kits, you know, things like 23andMe and Ancestry, which are enormously popular and, and offer a sort of narrative satisfaction and a place for people, um, regardless of whether they're the, the, the small, the minority of extreme right wing, you know, white supremacists who use these tests to demonstrate their racial purity or mm. most, most <laughs> the people who, videos are, yeah, are absolutely yeah. insane. And, yeah. Yeah, um, in, in some ways, you know, you take that sort of Swiftian view that you can't reason someone out of a position they didn't reason themselves into. But also, you get a, I get a lot of correspondence from people who are, again, well-intentioned, non-racist people who discovered that they've got ancestry, which is surprising to them um, because they mm -hmm. thought they knew their family tree. And actually, it's it, they're much more multi-ethnic than, than than they had previously thought. And, this, and, they can, and and the reverse of that, people thought they were more mixed than they actually were when they did right. the test. And, and it turns out they're not like descendants of Cherokee Nation or any absolutely that people believe they have. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, there's there's a uh, um, uh, we're, 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 we're progressing in a meandering conversation way, which means I'm not directly answering your questions, but I think that this That's is okay. how <laughs> conversations at midnight and one o'clock in France should be <laughs> over a glass of Chardonnay. Um, the, one of the stories I tell in the book is that my, um, my second cousin is a, is a keen genealogist and he's done the Rutherford family tree. So that's my paternal line, mm -hmm. which is from the Northeast of England and the, the Rutherford, Rutherford is a is a name that clusters around southern Scotland and northeast of England for hundreds of years, centuries, and they and they've done our family tree and and you know some interesting things pop up, such as the the I, my great 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 times six um, grandmother was called Mary Huntley, and on her wedding certificate it says Savage, right? And, Whoa, yeah. yeah. And we thought, and when we saw those, we were like. What, is, what does that mean? Um, and she was married to this guy called Ben Handy, who was a circus uh, owner, but Handy's Traveling Circus, it was called. And she was a horse jumper in this. And so the next generation back, we then went back another generation, and her father was a guy called Neil Huntley. And Neil Huntley was a Catawba tribesman who was famous for his horse jumping skills. And he was, as a lot of Native American people were at this time, imported from the US to Europe to join the circus, to be, you know, an exotic mm -hmm. entertainer for the masses. Now, I'm reading this 
and you know discovering this in my own family tree and thinking dude this is really cool right i've got a native american horse jumping circus performer who is, <laughs> who is my literal ancestor my great 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 whatever grandmother and the reason I use this story is because it means absolutely nothing. It means nothing about my identity. I, I don't carry, I probably don't carry any of her DNA for, for, for sort of biological reasons, which are, we won't go into now, but are in, in the book. Um, but also I don't claim any sort of cultural identity mm -hmm. associated with that because there is none. Um, and furthermore, it sort of plays up to that the concept of racial identity that we derive from our ancestry or that we like to derive from our ancestry, which I also think is meaningless because she, Mary Huntley probably has, so I, I, I don't, I, it's, it's, it's difficult to estimate the number, but it's probably hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of, of descendants in the UK and Europe because mm -hmm. that's how family trees work, right? And in, in the same way, I know we were talking about this the other day, in the same way that, you know, the, uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal or Washington Post, one of the two, um, published an article that identified a, a, a significant enslaved man, I forget his name, in, mm -hmm. in Barack Obama's matter. White ancestry, yeah. Yeah. And that's cool because you can't identify, it's difficult to identify individuals from your ancestry um is it surprising not in the least right you know most not if you know american history at exactly all. Yeah. exactly you know most white european uh, european descended americans have african ancestry via slavery right and and, and vice versa completely unaware of it yeah yeah and, and and i can't remember what the exact numbers are but it's like tw you know some uh, up to yeah. Up to twenty percent of the the African American genome, whatever that means, is European. And, and oh, absolutely, yeah, exactly. The typical, the average African American male in America is only eighty uh, percent West African descended. I did my um, own testing, and my dad hits that like seventy nine percent right on the mark. Uh huh. Amazing, amazing. And we we can one of the one of the really cool things about genetics is that we can test history we can and often it recapitulates known history and sometimes it challenges it and, and a, a paper published just in the last month did exactly that in a really interesting way it it, it, it demonstrated that there was a that there's massive overrepresentation of female africa west african ancestry in african americans in america mm -hmm. today and and there are multiple reasons for this but none of them are nice Right. The, the, the sexual relations between white males and enslaved females, which I don't need to explain, um, but also a, a massively increased death rate from um, uh, from males from working in much harsher conditions, mm -hmm. particularly rice fields, uh, particularly from from Sen uh, people imported from Senegal, imported, enslaved from, uh, because they they had you know rice skills. Uh, in places which where where malaria was rampant, right? So you know, many more men died than women. Many more women were raped, um, and and we can see that in the DNA of living people mm -hmm. today. Um, I definitely haven't answered your question now. <laughs> That's okay, and I'm 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 not going to force you into. It. Is it is it's one of the you know i started the week thinking that it was a question that was more answerable than i've finished the week thinking of it if that makes sense uh i'm <laughs> less sure thing, about right? my own yeah i think that is a good thing and i think that you know she provides in some ways uh a more interesting conversation around this than barack obama did for a variety of reasons one of which is that um you know she married a white man and i think that uh you know in, in a way Barack Obama marrying Michelle Obama and and the children and being in that family, I, I think it brought him into a into a. I think that we all have a kind of. We all have a way of kind of eyeballing it and and seeing if it looks like what we think it is. Uh, and I think Barack Obama satisfied many people, but Harris raised the question for others in a in a way that maybe is going to be really interesting. Um, but one you know, of the, again, oh, go ahead. One, one of the things I was going to say uh, I, that I got I sidetracked myself on was when I was I was giving a talk in Dubai, and uh, and a guy put his hand up and said, um, 
the one of the most successful um, ethno-cultural groups in America today is recent Nigerian immigrants. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right? Uh, who who have a completely different um, uh, uh, cultural experience in America than historical pe people descended from the, from from the enslaved. And yet, you know, we can we can categorize them very easily and say African American, or you know, or, or we can do it even more crudely by old Linnaean terms, which is via pigmentation or hair texture or physical characteristics. When in fact, you know, they're they're actually as genetically distinct, they're more genetically distinct than than white European descendants are from African Americans, or in fact, from either group to each other. Uh, and yet, it's jo it's just like you said, it, we don't have the terminology to 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 try and satisfy our need to taxonomize people. Um, the, the, the phrase that we sometimes use is that, that humans suffer from the tyranny of the discontinuous mind, right? We're <laughs> desperate to put people uh -huh. into categories or anything into categories. That's right. And that, so that's exactly when it broke down for me is when I couldn't, uh, it was very personal for me. I couldn't put my, daughter in 2013 when my first child was born, I couldn't put her into the category that I had grown up and been trained to um, think through. Um, she didn't fit. And so her presence in my life kind of exposed for the first time the kind of fiction of, uh, or what I guess I, I would call the fiction of race in a way that I hadn't questioned it before. Um, I just couldn't accept that, or I couldn't wrap my mind around how you can be a, a different race than your own child, or how my child could be a different <laughs> race than my father, but I could be um, inextricably directly linked to both of them. And so then the whole thing kind of fell apart for me yeah. um, that way. So, so I, I mean, I, I was incredibly moved by, by your book. It's a, it's a, it's a stunning piece of work. And, and, you know, I've said this to you before, the thing that was most striking to me about it is how we approach this subject from completely different ends of, it's not even a spectrum, but yours is a sort of personal cultural, um, uh, American stroke French uh, uh, attempt to understand what it means to be well racialized or mixed race mm -hmm. in, in the 21st century and how that affects your your identity and, and the identity of your children and and I, you know I'm, I'm approaching the subject from this sort of scientific view of what 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 how our basic biology relates to our, our identity both as individuals or as groups or as as ancestrally defined populations and so on and and we just uh it, it was like reading a sort of bizarro world version of my my <laughs> well, no, no that makes it sound bad it's just a sort of <laughs> you know okay. <laughs> but, but you know what i mean i mean it, it was i guess the question is does it matter you know why why do we do this why why does it matter that well yeah kamala harris is something it, it, it has an ancestry which is unusual in that population and therefore difficult to describe and therefore if you are of a certain political bent problematic right and there and therefore right. fair fair game um and i suppose i suppose part of the theme of the book is that you can't yeah it is this is right actually a lot of the theme of the book is that whatever the issues that we're discussing or whatever the racialized topics or people that are part of the, the public discourse on this, genetics is unlikely to be your ally or a, be a, a scaffold That's right. yeah. on which you can base those biases or prejudices or outright racisms. Well, that's a really interesting point that I guess I first started thinking about a few years ago when David Reich, uh, the, the Harvard geneticist, wrote mm. this op-ed in the New York Times that mm. got a lot of traction. And he wrote, um, if scientists can be confident of anything, it is that whatever we currently believe about the genetic nature of differences among populations is most likely wrong. Mm. Is that overstating it? Or uh, that's kind of what you were saying too, is that whatever, a lot of what we're thinking and have been thinking for a long time, genetics will upend it or we, our assumptions are not safe. Yeah, I think that um, this again relates to this sort of the idea of the tyranny of the discontinuous mind and our desires to name things rather than describe what they do. And th this is a more sort of philosophy of science question than, although I think it has cultural resonances as well, which is that 
and again, it relates to Linnaeus because Linnaeus is the guy who tries to name everything. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's doing this in a time where people are, everyone is a creationist, a biblical creationist. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about d nailing things down as this is the definitive form of a duck or a kangaroo or a person. These are created uh, to, to be inviolate and immutable. And then mm -hmm. uh, 100 years later, evolution has, has become an idea. And then 1859, um, Darwin describes how the mechanism by which all organisms are four-dimensional, that we, everything is transitional, everything is passing through time, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as well as space, all living things, um, at least. And so how this relates to so I started thinking about this a few years ago in relation to biology, that we're very bad at trying to label things and say, this is what it is, which is a really often, almost always, not a very useful scientific thing to do. Whereas what you should be doing is saying, what does it do? Mm -hmm. Right? Because what a thing is, 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 is less interesting or possibly more constricting than, than what it does. Because as soon as you say, a classic example of this is for 150 years, we've been describing Neanderthals and Homo sapiens as different species. Mm -hmm. And we've been defining species as two biological organisms that cannot have offspring that are fertile, right? That's the mm -hmm. standard mm -hmm. definition of a species. Um, and then in 2009, people like David Reich and others managed to get DNA out of Neanderthal <laughs> People have been dead for 50,000 years. And guess what? We we, they weren't our cousins. They were our ancestors because they, they had sex with Homo sapiens and we are the living offspring because we carry Neanderthal DNA. So what do you do with the definition of a species then? Do, are, they, are they a separate species or, or not? Uh, well, no, according to the species definition. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, according to physical um definitions of how we look at differences biological differences in any species and at which point i'm going well dude you're asking the wrong fucking questions oh, sorry you're asking the wrong <laughs> you're asking... Okay. <laughs> it's, it's for the listeners in america it's one o'clock in paris and it's midnight in, <laughs> in london um uh, you know if you're so wedded to something being a different species that reality conflicts with what that mm -hmm. definition actually says, then you're not doing science, right? It has mm -hmm. to inform your, your experiment. The definition it is subservient to its behavior. Right. Um, so I think that, you know, how this relates to the conversation about race is, well, that, that's, what, that's what the biology, that's what the genealogy, that's what the genetics does. It, 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 it will not conform. Evolution and human behavior will not conform to our crude and superficial and ephemeral taxonomies. Mm -hmm. Because these taxonomies are only a few hundred years old and we just assume that they're permanent. But the historical record says something completely different, that, that uh, pigmentation is recognized as a phenotypic characteristic, but it's not how the Romans or the Greeks categorized people. They were much more interested in othering and slaughtering people based on language or religion or mm -hmm. cultural practices and expressed very little interest in pigmentation as a, as a defining character. Yeah, and you could imagine, as James Baldwin um, posited, that one day uh, the pigmentation in your epidermis could be as meaningful as the pigmentation in your iris or your, or your hair follicles, or your hair, you know. It, yeah. it doesn't have to be the thing that gives the definition to your lifelong identity. Uh, we, we make that the reality that we live in right now. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in your book, you really you, you go into one of the, the most dangerous uh, areas, which is which is IQ and and uh, and genetics. And I felt I felt like that's where the book really um, I felt um, gives a, the reader a lot of tools to counter what um, are some pretty um, awful arguments that are that are that are gaining confidence i think um out there on the internet and and in and in the mainstream so uh you want to elaborate on that before we open yeah up the sure i mean so, so this is this is another area where i i tried to be in the book i tried to be scientifically honest whilst also so, so in, in order that i didn't fall prey to the trap of 
the accusations which I get all the time, which is you, you, you're you're sacrificing science at the altar of political correctness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a side issue to that, which is that the notion that science is neutral and that the data is neutral and it's apolitical and amoral is total bullshit, right? And it always has been mm -hmm. total bullshit. And when people state that, and they do all the time, and there's a particular mindset of, of sort of people self-described skeptics, um, or data bros who do this, they're just, they're just ignorant of the history of science, right? Science is always political. Lawrence Krauss wrote a piece in the Wall Street mm -hmm. Journal, and uh, I think it was, a, I think, actually think it was republished from Quillette, um, uh, where he argued that um, science was by its very nature apolitical and could not be racist, right? And I think that it, <laughs> it was sort of uninterestingly wrong. And it, I, I'm willing to concede that um, maybe high-end particle physics is less prone to structural racisms of society than anthropology or mm -hmm. human genetics or evolution. But it's, it, it's still wrong because as long as data sets are created by people and as long as science is done by people, Right. And in fact, more it's and more. It's never going to be in the platonic form. Yeah. Exactly. And it, we, 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 we're discovering more and more these days as well that even when you remove people by creating AIs that do scientific jobs so for they us, they reproduce it. They reproduce it. Because yep. you put garbage in, you get garbage out. Um, and in trivial ways, it's you know automatic hand sanitizers that don't recognize dark skin because <laughs> right. they, they've only been trained on white yeah. skin or stuff like that. Um, I can't remember what the question was now because I was rambling. Oh, oh it's just, you know, you want to unpack how, because one of the places you say, uh, oh, yeah, intelligence, you know, racists like to yeah. use genetics as a kind of weapon of their own. Uh, yeah. And so you do have to understand how to counter, you know, when they say, aha, but, you know, there are um, differences uh, among uh, racial groups uh, or what we think of as population groups that we call racial groups. Uh, there are average differences in and IQ and some of them are significant and you know yeah uh, how does the anti-racist uh, uh, argue with that yeah so uh, well you know it, this is hard because this is one of the most incendiary topics in the whole of science and the whole history of science and it's also one of the areas that has been most politicized in the history right. of of science particularly in the US less so in the UK but the the invention of IQ, which I think is a valid metric. I think it, it, it mm -hmm. is, a, is a metric which, which deserves scrutiny for many reasons, because it has predictive power, um, but also because it's been studied for so long that um, even if we don't know exactly what it's measuring, the fact that we have such reams of data on it means it has some validity mm -hmm. in measuring a cognitive ability, right? Uh, which isn't the same as saying it measures intelligence because that's a vague, fluffy definition that, that, that can't be, that is not very satisfactory. But IQ has validity. Now, this kind of relates back to what we were saying a minute ago about um, is the data right to reinforce the stereotype? And f we do have some data on countrywide average IQs from around the world. The problem with this is that well, one of the many problems with this is that much of that data has been generated by a very small cadre of scientists who are out and out racists, right? So, <laughs> right. So, <laughs> the people that originally went looking for that. Yeah, right, right. And, yeah. and, and, and this is an example of scientists being, not doing due diligence because you know how referencing works. Someone does a study which become, which gets referenced somewhere else and it gets repackaged yeah. in a tertiary review and then someone else looks at it and, and uses that and then you base some data on that. You know, and by the time you, you're 20 years down the line, no one's looked at the original data for 20 years. But when you do look at the original data for some of these national IQs, they're just fraudulent or mm -hmm. so wrong. Things like uh, the average IQ of one country they didn't have any data for, so they just averaged it for the two neighboring countries. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know, and that data has been cited dozens, if not hundreds of times as being a fact that this yeah. country has a sub hundred IQ on average when actually no measurements were taken or taking, uh, you know, the, the, one, of, one of the valid challenges that psychologists, good psychologists are very aware of is that IQ is culturally biased, which it is. Now, if you're aware of the fact that it's culturally biased, 
that that confounding factor isn't necessarily scientifically problematic. Mm -hmm. But if you ignore it, then it definitely is, right? And some of those data sets that have been subsequently used and were generated by people who were somewhere between fraudulent or just straight up racist are, are, are based on cultural biases within the testing system, which are just unaccountably bad. You know, like using children who not only don't speak that language and then subsequently have IQs that fall well below the standard deviation, you know, one or two standard deviations and saying, well, that's the national average IQ of this entire country. Um, uh, well, well, you know, that's deeply problematic in terms of mm -hmm. reusing that data subsequently. And we've seen some sort of high profile cases in the last year, or at least high profile within certain domains, within certain social media domains as well, where controversial papers have been pulled because the scientists were unaware or or had ignored right. the fact that the data sets that they were using were just just absolute garbage um so that's one aspect to it right mm -hmm. so you you know check the data before you start is, is this is the data you're relying on is it good and in many cases the answer is seriously no um now then on top of that, you got the notion that there are natural variances in 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 IQs, and 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 maybe I think I think probably realistically some countries have higher national IQs than than others. Can this be explained genetically? Is the question, and I think the answer is a categorical no to that. We do see different diff, different uh, genetic structure in different populations and different ancestral populations the new techniques that have been invented in the last four or five years to try and assess these are valid and interesting but particularly bad at comparing populations mm -hmm. diff different populations very good at testing within populations but bad at testing between populations but you know we, this conversation is in danger of stepping into the really serious reads here of complex statistics molecular biology and 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 population genetics which very few people understand and i'm only on the border of understanding these things <laughs> right and i have to go to much smarter than people to than than me in order to try and, and really get my head around what's being you know what, what is actually being measured here but that but doesn't that's stop the confidence that's the confidence of ignorance that uh that Darwin talked about that you quoted in the book, you know, the, the ignorant are much more confident in just going out there and stating uh, the position than, than, than the people like yourself who are, who are really trying to figure out what's going on on a genetic level. Well, it's a sort of, yeah, yeah, that's, I do think that's right. And it's, it, you know, it's one of the, uh, it's one of the curses of being scientifically minded that uh, you, you have to perpetually doubt your results. Right. And, and, and that's, you know, a basic premise of science is that, that you, whatever you produce, you assume it's wrong. Right. Uh, um, and if you keep more testing it- More humility in, 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 in science than on Twitter, that's for sure. Yeah, well, that's definitely true. And of course, it's the opposite in politics, right? right? You, exactly. you know, the concept exactly. of a U-turn is, is shows your strength as a scientist. To change your mind right. is, is the greatest thing a scientist can do. To change your mind as a politician is suicide. Exactly. Um, I, think, uh, I think at this point, even though I'd love to keep- um, Pestering you with my own questions. I think we've got some questions to take. Sure. Um, okay, we, well, for, uh, for, for the listeners, we, you know, we've been trying to do this now since February, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in person at various book events, um, just in any capacity. And then, you know, the world turned upside down. So here's one. Uh, why is there, and it's definitely to you, why is there such an enduring link between social Darwinism and race? i.e. Nazi and American obsession with skull size, what can be done to help change the minds of those who are bent on using social Darwinism as a justification for racist beliefs, despite it being invalid? That's from Anais Leichtling. That's a hell of a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's and, a man and, at one in the morning. Yeah, it, it, it kind of links up, um, it, it links up with this, the two closely related but different concepts which is scientific racism and eugenics and um the some of the concepts of scientific racism which which were the attempts to biologize the differences between people 
um, that, that's sort of that's what scientific racism effectively was. Um, and the attempts to shape societies via effectively just by reproductive control. Uh, that, that 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 was formalized as the eugenics project that sort of began in the late 19th century um and for the first 50 years of its existence was considered a good thing by by people across the political spectrum in 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 Europe in the UK where it was founded at my university UCL um but but particularly enacted in in the states and this is relevant to what we we're talking about a minute ago because IQ was a big factor in this so if you can actually attach a metric such as IQ or such as physical characteristics like mm -hmm. skull shape um, to behavioral characteristics, or you can use those data to reinforce a political ideology and say, well, these people are different from us, from whoever the he hegemonic power is, is. Uh, then you have, you have the tools to politicize it in any direction that your political ideology takes you. So, you, you know, that, that, that could be saying, well, we need to treat everyone the same, even though there are biological me measurable differences, or on the other end of the political spectrum, we, we need to sterilize these people because we need to eradicate them from, from, from this population because they are, they are bringing the overall health of a nation down. Now, you know, in the UK, eugenics was much more class focused than race focused mm -hmm. um and i think that reflects uh, maturity is not the right word but the 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 longer history that that um, britain has associated or europe has associated with social structures than than in in the in america north america where it was heavily racialized from from the from the get-go so attaching metrics like iq and measuring people and say, particularly African Americans, and saying these people have low IQ was used as justification for involuntary sterilization, which which accounts for well, thirty one states had had mm -hmm. um, had eugenics programs. We estimate something like sixty to eighty thousand people were involuntary sterilized, including up until the nineteen seventies, and in fact, most recently in California in like two thousand and twelve. Right, so this is something which has largely gone away, but but really hasn't gone away, um, uh, in a true sense. Um, how do we move beyond that? Well, again, it's about trying to recognise two things simultaneously: that people are different, that that there is inherent variance between individuals and between ancestral population groups. Um, and not being shy from saying that those are real things and sometimes they're biologically informative but the but the, that that is the second point is are they meaningful are they differences which um uh, are medically or culturally or or evolutionarily meaningful and you know the overall tenor of this conversation is well it depends how what you're looking at right and if you want to categorize people by whether they can drink milk or not, or their eye color, or their skin color, or whether they have sickle cell susceptibility, or you know whatever, you, you can do it by whatever you choose, and none of them make more sense than any other. I think we have time for one last question, and you're going to love this. Uh, so how do you argue with a racist? <laughs> I've got to go and now. That's from books and books. <laughs> Well, it's a hardback, so the spine is very sharp. Um, <laughs> no, that's that's not. I don't endorse that view at all. Um, so, you know, I, I said earlier that Jonathan Swift line um, that you can't reason a person out of a position they didn't reason themselves into. And that to a certain extent is why I want to park the, the white supremacists and actual neo-Nazis that I spend quite a lot of time tracking and you know, looking at the conversations they're having about gen gen concepts of genetic purity and so on. But the, the non-racists or the well-intentioned people who express racialized stereotypes or your drunk uncle or, or, <laughs> or, 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 or who are not your specifically, Thomas, um, um, but the, you know, the people who say, well, black people are better at sport and that's a good thing, or Jews are better with money and you know, who doesn't want to be, want that. I, th I th we have good evidence that close networks and families are the best places for, for contesting 
controversial views. Um, we, we have good evidence that shouting at people is, not only is ineffective, but often has the effect of making people double down on their views. Um, I, I like to think, because I'm a wishy-washy liberal, that ha having better arguments is the way that you persuade people. Or maybe, 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 you, maybe that isn't a liberal viewpoint. Is that isn't that the marketplace of ideas or whatever that idea is? Um, but I'd like to think that when someone says, you know, as a result of transatlantic slavery, black people in America have superior athletic genes, and that is why you see their dominance in the hundred meters in the Olympics. And that is why for 30 years we've seen the majority of NBA players being of African-American descent. Um, I'd, I'd like to equip people with the tools to, A, point out why, that is, why the data is incorrect, which it almost certainly is in those two cases, um, and why, why it matters, you know, where we started, why those positive, those, those assumed positive stereotypes are actually Mm -hmm. simply reaffirming the structural racism that our societies are built on, the thing that is that we most need to change. You know, when people think about, I think often, if you haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this deeply, people just assume that racism is, is calling people racialized epithets, which is important. And, if, you know, it's, a, it's important that that is, that is tackled and that is unacceptable. But structural racism is the problem. The, 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 the fact that hegemonic power is maintained um, via whatever political or pseudoscientific uh, framework um, uh, can be grabbed hold of, that we're basically, that so many people are just unaware of, that that, that, that is where the real fight is. And I, I, I think the main message of the book is you can, be a, you can be racist, you can be a bigot if you want, but you can't have my tools to, mm -hmm. to defend that position. Thank you. I think that that's um, one of the most important messages that we can be hearing right now. Um, and I can't think of a more important book for the moment. Um, congratulations. I wish that we could do this uh, in person in Miami, but hopefully yeah. again somewhere else. Next time. And before, before we go, you should buy this book. This is, you should you buy this buy, book. You can buy both. From the green bar just down here. <laughs> exactly. And you guys are both incredibly brilliant i think um I, if everyone is as intimidated as i am to ask questions i mean um this has been a fascinating very insightful conversation and i thank you very much and i hope our viewers will go ahead and order these two books and read more and learn more and that we will see each other in miami in real life very soon um this also made me think of gender for whatever that's mm -hmm. you know like can there be um, a, a race fluid? If there's a gender fluid, would there be a possibility? Yeah, don't be careful on Twitter. <laughs> be careful on Twitter with that. That's why right. I don't even want to say it. But anyway, so many hey, interesting. I've got I've got enough battles to fight already. <laughs> and I thank you I might so much aside from this one. <laughs> for, for joining us all the way from London, all the way from Paris. Good night, everyone. Good night to our viewers. Take good care of yourselves. <laughs>